Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar, Global Influences on IoT Agile Billing Development, sponsored by MDS Global. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get time to you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow Help widget. Here you can find answers to the common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resources widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask you for your feedback. A survey will pop open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to our moderator, Heavy Reading Senior Analyst, Stephen Bell. Thank you very much, Becky, and welcome everybody to this webinar, Global Influences on IoT Agile Billing Development, sponsored by MDS. Uh, I am joined today by uh, Akil Chimoka, who is Product Marketing Director for MDS, and he has led product marketing and been part of the team uh, for a number of years. He started his career in South Africa with Telecom SA as a developer before joining Telecom Systems, where he helped establish product and commercial leadership. Today, he works across departments at MDS Global, inputting to product strategy, commercial and company positioning, and has extensive experience in market and product strategy, drawing on all aspects of technology, industrial and regulatory evolution. And Akil has an MBA from the Imperial College London Business School, and he's based in London. So welcome, Akil, to our session today. Uh, Thank you very much. I am, I am Steve Bell, uh, Senior Analyst for Heavy Reading and specializing in IoT. And on our agenda today, we are going to cover some survey results that uh, we, car we carried out in uh, May of this year. And then Akil will cover the Agile IoT monetization strategies. Um, and we will have about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A at the uh, back end of the session. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, make this interactive with us and uh, to send your questions by the Q&A box uh, that uh, Becky was pointing out at the side. We will also have two poll questions, one in between my session and uh, Akil's, and one at the back end of Akil's, uh, which will also give you further opportunity to, to interact with us. So what I'm going to cover this morning uh, is the overview and demographics of the survey, and then walk through what the state of play of IoT is for CSPs, uh, proposition and service plan rollouts and what uh, CSPs are doing, how they're utilizing existing billing systems, and the biggest hurdles that they are finding in executing on IoT monetization. We'll also explore what we found out about monetization and agile billing, and talk a little bit about the road forward and some concluding thoughts. The survey uh, that we ca carried out was in May of 2019, and it covered 109 uh, respondents from communication service providers uh, on a global basis. Um, and we probed their current and future Internet of Things billing and monetization strategies. We were lucky enough to get 87% of the responders being mobile or converged network operators. And of those that responded, 39% were in the US, 24% in Europe, 18% in the Asia Pacific area, including Australia and New Zealand, and 14% from Central South America and the Caribbean. Uh, Middle East was 4% and Canada was 1%. 
when we looked at IoT propositions and service rollouts, uh, we were looking at what markets um, the service providers were focused on. And what we found was that on a global basis, the, the number one market on a weighted average basis, where four is fully operational and three is engaging with partners, two is currently planning strategy and one nobody has a plan, we found that utilities were coming in at 2.69. So very engaged with partners, but not 100% or fully operational across all CSPs. And utilities is, is clearly one of the early markets um, with metering in Europe and in Asia and other parts of the world uh, being a, a predominant sort of connectivity driven uh, opportunity. Smart cities is another one, uh, particularly where you're looking at the uh, utilization of street lights or if you're looking at um, transportation management for fleets, um, if you're looking at um, refuge and garbage re removal uh, opportunities. Uh, smart buildings and transport and logistics obviously is, a, is another key area. But again, fleet management on a global basis and smart buildings because of the fact that, um, you know, as, as um, property owners look to lower their cost, they're looking at IoT connectivity as a mechanism for controlling heating and ventilation systems, managing um, security, and then also managing the uh, overall energy consumption within the building, and then automotive with the connected car. Um, what we found was that um, the regional uh, diversity was, was much more uh, interesting. Asia actually followed very closely the overall average. Um, with EMEA, again, utilities being a strong, strong area of focus, but transport and logistics being the uh, second most prominent, followed by uh, automotive and connected cars, and then smart cities. The interesting one was Central and South America, where transport and logistics um, at 2.8 was the number one ranking, followed by agriculture. And agriculture wasn't seen uh, in other areas uh, at, at all. Um, and I think that's noticeable because of the fact that um, you know, the wide area coverage of that region is requiring a totally different approach in order to be able to get some of the responses. North America was utilities and smart buildings, uh, followed by smart homes. So again, when you look at this, the key takeaway is the diversity of focus and priority across the regions. So if we, if we think about this, it's essential for CSPs to recognize the state of play in IoT. IoT has been explored by a broad cross-section of industries, but it's been a very difficult time. Um, most, most industries are looking at um, trying to improve efficiencies in their supply chain or manufacturing processes, quality assurances, um, as well as how their performance of products through the connectivity and use of analysis can be improved um, and across the supply chain. But it's still a very nascent market. And due to the slow uptake in many industries as they struggled with proof of concepts and pilot projects, demand for connectivity and additional services has been much slower than many anticipated. However, the next 36 months could see an exponential growth in the uh, uptake uh, as many industries put into place the lessons they've learned as they've gone through this struggle. And I think you'll start to see that this connectivity impact will actually uh, significantly improve. Um, and as the lessons learned, most of the companies will start to talk to and work with CSPs rather than try and do it themselves. Um, and you're going to see a number of things happen. One is the diversity uh, of projects will start to emerge and you'll see cross-pollination of lessons learned in different industries being shared by systems integrators and partners in ecosystems um, across the industry. And you'll also see an increase in the complexity of those projects as well, uh, requiring a broader ecosystem of partners. 
So the three things to walk away from is that as new technologies of AI, cloud, edge, and compute help to redefine workflows at a much faster pace than was uh, originally an anticipated, you're going to see industries exploring many new types of products and services requiring this broad ecosystem of, of partners. And the pace at which this is going to occur is, in many respects, likely to take the industry by surprise. So complexity, speed of take up, and diversity are going to be the key elements. Um, now, CSPs will need to be prepared to provide a, enhanced monetization offers across this emerging ecosystem and along the evolving IoT value chain. So then we looked at CSP's existing billing services, and we, we asked them, how do you bill your IoT? 57% said that they did it based on network data uh, volume. 55% uh, well, do it on subscribed SIM connections. 47% uh, do it on revenue shared customer payments. So what you're seeing is the variability in the market served to shape the billing mechanisms. And there's also this diversity of billing approach with the two traditional mechanisms of network data volume and subscribed identity being the lead offerings. But this Revenue share element of end customer payments indicates a more progressive approach to supporting the commercial models is, is emerging. And so when we look at the regional view of this, what we, what we discover is that in North America, the revenue share is the predominant method of billing. Uh, in no other region does this revenue share rank in the top billing, top two billing mechanisms. In Asia, the preferred billing mechanism is network data volume. Um, as is the, um, the situation in Europe with 71% as the preferred billing. But in, in Central and South America, it subscribes SIN connections. Again, reflecting maybe the different types of markets and, and priorities that are being served. So then we looked at how do they support the billing and monetization services. And what we found was 39% of CSPs are utilizing their existing business support systems. Um, but in aggregate, 46% are utilizing new agile billing platforms, uh, bespoke developments, or third-party outsourced partners. In North America, 30% and 29% in EMEA have utilized new agile billing mechanisms um, and monetization platforms. And additionally, 26% of CSPs in the EMEA have used a bespoke development. And this, this was the highest of any of the regions. 47% uh, of the larger CSPs that we looked at are still utilizing their existing BSS. And, and only 17% of them are looking at some form of evolved agile billing. So it was interesting then to look at the smaller CSPs and found that 30% of them are looking at new platforms and 16% are looking at bespoke development. I think you're starting to see that there is an increasing agility and willingness to explore opportunities to, to work with um, other partners to try and take advantage. Whereas the larger uh, CSPs that have got these massive investments are trying to work with what they've got rather than looking at uh, agile approaches. Um, we also find, found that some of the biggest hurdles in executing this IoT monetization was that um, the multi-partner management uh, in an ecosystem is very difficult. Uh, this was very closely followed by the complexities associated with mediation and recognition of the challenges posed by the agile nature of billing in its own respect. So as this ecosystem builds up, as the diversity of projects increases, as the complexity increases, um, the requirement for some form of agility is being recognized in, in the uh, CSP community. Um, so then we looked at monetization and agile billing um, that are being used by the customers. And what we found was that CSPs were aware of the different business models that IoT enterprises were using. But at this point in time, the most common mechanism is still network usage-based billing. Uh, but you are stand seeing sort of this combined with standalone IoT device sales um, as the 
traditional mechanisms. The newer services are still fairly low down in the in the priority at this point of time. Uh, when we looked at uh, the regional billing variances, what we found again was that the regions were focusing on the uh, markets, and this was being reflected mm -hmm. in the billing services. So. Again, when we saw that uh, overall network usage-based billing was being the, the number one mechanism, in Asia that also was reflected, as in Europe and, in, and also in Central and South America. But in the North American market, it was a combination of usage-based billing services and subscription for IoT devices. But as you can see walking across this, it starts to break up um, as you start to look at the different rankings across the, uh, the regions. Um, and this, again, I think the most important thing is to reflect the diversity of the IoT vertical businesses that each of the CSPs is, is serving. Um, we asked CSPs whether or not they were doing agile billing, um, and 41% said they were, and 59% said that they weren't. Um, EMEA uh, had a higher percentage of not using agile billing, um, whereas uh, Asia had a higher percentage um, of people utilizing the, uh, the, the agile billing. Um, of the 41% of CSPs providing agile billing, 44% are providing billing to end consumers on behalf of their customers, 35% are providing partner settlement, and 21% are providing billing to multiple parties along the value chain. Of the 59% of CSPs that aren't performing agile billing, 39% said it's because they've had no requirement uh, for engagement on this with their customers. 31% believe that agile billing services are covered by their traditional network BSS processes. And 29% believe it's too complex for them to serve. 26% uh, believe that the business is too risky for them at this point of time to serve. And 13% believe that customers prefer to source or build agile billing services themselves. So if we step back for a second and look at this and, and look at it in terms of the road forward, what we've got is the current offerings uh, of, from a BSS perspective, um, you know, the drivers were high efficiency, low footprint, and low cost. And traditional billing and charging mechanisms with a common set of functions that could scale and be efficient and, and based on a capital expenditure were the easy way to, to get to market. But as the IoT business case starts to evolve, as we've talked about, in terms of diversity, disaggregated value chains, uh, evolving definitions, very low margin business. In some cases, you know, like Deutsche Telekom um, has a $1 uh, for 10 year um, or $1, one dollar a year for 10 years for some of their applications and AT&T are following similar mechanisms, very low cost, very low margin opportunities. But at the same time, we're seeing the beginnings of very complex approaches. And as those complex approaches uh, emerge, you're gonna see more enablement challenges. There's gonna be commercial variability. Uh, there's going to be further drives to lower the cost to serve, the more partner ecosystem development, increasing capacity, operational support complexity, and increasing complexity overall around the hierarchies, multi-tenancy, multi-sided settlements, non-billable records, real-time charging. Lots of things that, that the existing traditional billing mechanism aren't going to be able to, to solve, particularly when customers start to talk about outcomes, pay-per-use, Usage, product upselling, benefit share, etc. So a new IoT BSS that's agile, scalable, cost efficient, cloud based, um, and maybe on an OPEX based uh, makes a lot of sense. So how do you make decisions about this? Well, there's obviously the opportunity to extend with the current vendor. 
there's the opportunity to do an adjunct and offline with the current or new vendor, or you could move to a cloud-based solution. Now, the selection criteria on this can be on cost of transaction, cost of sale, ongoing digital transformation of the legacy system, how far you are, how progressive you are, and, and whether or not you want to move to cloud-native scalability. So there's lots of challenges, but it doesn't finish there. Because what we've also noticed is that in the ecosystem, it's about analytics of non-billable research that you can provide information to your ecosystem partners to give insight and visibility on new opportunities. And this cross-vertical cross-pollination is the thing that really is going to drive those new opportunities. But there's a challenge with this, and, and the challenge has to be recognized, which is that the IoT service chain is extremely complex. If you go from an OEM, he's going to be work, they're going to be working with partners that add on capability. Um, there may be applications that are um, within the service offering or within the product. Uh, that are incremental. There may be services around the introduction, servicing, and support of the product. There's ongoing security, and then there's lifetime support. So you have to look at this across the life cycle for IoT as well. So there's the development time, taking all of those aspects into, into account, looking at the product introduction, looking at the ramp, maturity, uh, and ultimately the retirement and after sales support. Each one of those is going to be a mechanism for security updates, software updates, uh, changes in, in pricing, changing in charging, changing in service upgrades, um, all of which is going to occur across that life cycle and across the value chain. And it's this which is going to be the, the fundamental complexity that all of the CSPs and all of the partners in the ecosystem are going to be dealing with. And it's, it's the opportunity for really CSPs moving from being the, um, the simple uh, providers of connectivity into something else. So in terms of concluding thoughts, the IoT market is still very nascent. Uh, the regional perspective is very important in terms of shaping the development of propositions and approaches. Most CSPs are still at a very early stage um, of developing their billing strategies and exploring new I IoT monetization models. And CSPs are aware of the emerging billing models that are coming and being used by small and medium-sized IoT vendors. The diversity of applications will continue to increase. The number of partners in the ecosystem will grow. Um, and the complexity and speed at which this happens is going to be increasing rapidly. CSPs need to adopt new billing support systems to move beyond being just a connectivity provider and towards the functional role of a lead enabler. So with that, uh, my uh, presentation concludes, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear from the audience um, what your thoughts are and, and where you stand at this point of time in terms of what are your projections in terms of hitting revenue targets for IoT connectivity this year? Are you well above targets, above target, in line with targets, below targets, or well below targets? So. Akil, maybe you'd like to, to join me um, in this transition point. And um, what do you think in terms of the, uh, uh, the overall sort of results and, and what are you anticipating from this poll question? Yeah, hi, Stephen. Thanks. Um, well, I'm expecting an answer roughly around below targets, um, only because when we've sort of analyzed a number of um, annual reports from across some of the, the larger IT um, service providers, what we're seeing is, is that generally they're all sort of well below their target revenues for IT connectivity compared to the predictions the year before. Um, I thought that they're still, they're on sort of target in terms of the number of connections they projected, but uh, the overall revenue that they projected is, is coming a bit short. and. Hence, when I, when I sort of talk, I'll be sort of touching upon sort of why some of the um, service providers are moving into a different role to shore up the revenues. So 
So, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, you know, you look at um, even the major players, they're all talking about their connectivity levels, but they're not really sort of, uh, there's only a few that are sharing their revenues. And, and most, even the largest players, their IOT <laughs> is, is no more than a billion dollars. So when you start looking at that relative to the overall uh, revenue income for the industry, it's still very, very nascent. So it'll be interesting to see. So let's see what the results are. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 44% said it's in line with targets, 27 below, 5% uh, well below, 16% above targets, um, and 5% above. So almost a normal distribution there. Wow. Yeah. Well, slightly skewed towards below, maybe. Um, <laughs> in line with what we're sort of projecting, but um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be surprised if we're skewed more towards above targets, uh, yeah, but in line with targets. Maybe. Okay. Maybe they've aligned their uh, targets more. Thank you. <laughs> I think a lot, a lot of businesses do that, don't they? Um, I mean, we, we've also sort of got some of this information from some of the GSMA intelligence reports. You know, they've also been looking, uh, analyzing even the sort of the top sort of ten. IT, you know, I think about 65% of the market is owned by these top 10 players from Telenor to Verify to Telefonica. And they, and they did some analysis there and they said also uh, their revenues were were shrinking, but also the certification target was on, or was, was on target. So, okay. Well, the floor is yours, friend. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, Good morning, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks for taking interest in our talk on global influences of agile IT monetization. So I'd like to give it a, a slightly additional perspective to what Stephen was talking about. So my name is Akil Chimoko. I, I work here, um, I look after marketing here at MDS Global. Uh, we are a BSS as a service provider looking after revenue management for some of the largest tier one down to tier four CSPs and MVNOs. And I'll sort of touch on our solution for IoT monetization later on in my presentation. So I'd like to set the scene first to what is driving the need for this agile monetization solutions. With projected or well, projections of millions of industrial and consumer products becoming services through data connectivity, everyone, including CSPs and MBNOs, have been rubbing their hands at the opportunity it brings in terms of revenue as well as new connections. And the benefits are compelling for the market on both a feature and an experience level. As you can see through some of our examples on the presentation, like the Connected Trainer, for example. But I think equally important, IT enables products to become to be recommercialized into long-term services and revenues, which are driving these new monetization thoughts. So instead of buying a pair of trainers, up front, um, you may buy it by a service. It's looked after by Nike, for example, and you know they will track it and tell you when to replace it. They'll authenticate it for you. They may provide discounts, etc., going forward. However, for many CSPs and MBOs, you know they're actually finding those that revenues from IT connectivity are actually starting to trend to very low margins. And Steve mentioned this before. If you just look at once, who are a dodgy telecom business, they launched a 10 euro for a 10 year machine to machine SIM with data and roaming included. And obviously, this is a no frill solution designed to create some upsell opportunities, but nevertheless, the bar has been set very low. And also, premium connectivity like GSMA, mobile, cellular is only a really a small proportion of IoT connectivity. Wi-Fi and LoRa are actually big alternatives for most IoT projects. And IoT platform connectivity only really forms a very small element of IoT investment contracts, 5% uh, according to the GSMA, with most expenditures today going on development of IoT platforms, the applications and the devices which, which can for around 68% uh, according to the same GSMA report. So can CSPs and MVNOs access a greater share of this 
burgundy markets rather than sell just low margin connectivity. So what we're trying to examine here is the case of CSPs and MVNOs and boutique specialists taking the role, you know, part or whole of a lead, lead IoT enabler. And what is that? Well, today enterprises looking to digitalize their business are faced with a daunting plethora of technologies to employ IoT into their ideas. Right? They're looking at technologies from IoT platforms and devices to new monetization solutions and edge solutions. The enterprise is both old and new with either try and build it themselves, and you know, according to some of the survey results, only a few, between 15 and 60 percent would do this, or either or either, more often than not, outsource it or ask for different elements of design, build, and operate to one or more lead enabler. Yeah, these are the guys that put together the solution for them. Uh, Gata believes outsourcing enables them to be 60% faster to market, enables a total of TCO saving of about 30%. So this, you know, and actually, in fact, the volume of IT service contracts in itself, you know, deals uh, with IT service companies that contain IT requirements are also on the rise. Today, they make up about 10% of all deals, according to Ovum. So this is driving a number of players into the market, from traditional system integrators and IT outsourcers to boutique service providers, CSPs, and IT MVNOs. Now, looking at CSP specifically, some 40% odd, like Stephen found in the survey, have started to make plans to move up the chain into this lead IT enablement. IT enablement role. When it comes to billing and settlement, IT enterprises use a range of models from subscriptions to event-based rating like paper minute bike rentals or paper alert security service and combinations thereof to charge customers. And like the survey, we also identified that many IT businesses also involve multiple stakeholders like partners that are supplying goods per customer for example, connectivity or devices, or delivering operational services, for example, installing or maintaining products from the IT events or outcomes that may happen. And these must also be, you know, this also must be included in that monetization chain. And critically for many IT projects, cap CapEx heavy approaches simply don't enable them to be commercially feasible. You know, for example, they can't go off and buy bulk devices or bulk connectivity or into employ you know, full-time people around these services. Many of these businesses are looking for growth or looking at growth-based or revenue-based settlement models with their partners and suppliers, where these stakeholders are actually rewarded on the basis of value or outcome delivered. And today, in fact, actually many OEM device manufacturers have actually gone further and have started to offer revenue sharing or pay-per-use models on new commercial engagement strategies to support this whole IoT initiative or market better. So for CSPs to go beyond selling connectivity, some CSPs have started to create separate IoT business units or operating practices with a culture and approach to make you know, the IoT, you know, to, well, to approach the IoT market better, like some of the cousin MVNOs or system integrators. And this includes aggregating Global network services involves investing in consultancy units and assets such as IT platforms and the skills to build on top of them. It also includes considering an OPEX versus a CAPEX focused commercial engagement model. And this, as Stephen mentions, includes investing or developing uh, new IT monetization solutions. At this stage, let me just maybe take you through an example or a case study. Okay. This is one of our customers engaged with us by one of the largest operators offering a global N NBIT network. Varyon is a U.S. business. They offer an IoT-based solution to replace unsafe kerosene lamps in rural villages. It's a solar-driven pay-as-you-use electricity system. It demands no capital investment or upfront payment from individuals, businesses, schools, or villages. You know, the customers simply pay a microcharge costing less than the kerosene itself for the energy they use. And the system also provides them local Wi-Fi by the embedded 3G, 4G backhaul over which also paid content is also available. 
Now, importantly for our call, you know, for our topic on this call, I thought this is a well-funded project. That whole model, which allows them to survive, is driven by a revenue-sharing model across both the infrastructure partners as well as the operational partners in the field. And this also includes the CSP. In this case, the T1 European operator, who through this model actually makes four times as much revenue as they would have by just selling gyms alone to the project from the outset. This is only one example of a growing number of commercial models that we are experiencing. Yeah. Now, the industry is actually awash with all kinds of variations. For example, pay by my insurance. You know, the ones with those connected black boxes in the car are now looking to offer different rates per mile based on driving behavior, uh, time of day, driving environment to further lower insurance premiums. We've seen industrial machinery typically leased that can now have variable payments linked to usage cycles and service maintenance monitoring via embedded telemetrics to make it more economical for both parties to service. We've seen smart city refuge projects where partners get rewarded not on revenues generated, but actually on quantifiable savings made, such as less miles driven by refuge trucks that therefore cause less maintenance, congestion, and pollution. We've seen also free agriculture platforms for farmers that enable partner companies who fund it to sell specific products and services to farmers to increase their yield based on the data collected about the soil. And so on and so on. Now, this is just really the start of so many different commercial structures, many starting simple, as Stephen said, and getting more complex and agile to deal with competition, profitability, and innovation. So I'll start to summarize some of these challenges. So you know, both the IT enablement players as well as IT businesses or enterprises are faced with these with a number of challenges. For the enabler, every deal demands a very different monetization approach based on the project. And so the cost to serve has to be light while flexible to be able to win projects, even well-funded ones. The other side of the fence. IT enterprises typically don't have the operational experience um, to manage you know, dynamically recurring payments with assurance on accuracy, fraud, or collections, or et cetera. They must equally support their partners as, 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 well, as well as they do the customers, you know, providing operational and financial transparency so they can operate successfully too as part of the project. And this is actually not really about just a new product or a platform. It's actually actually having an assured monetization practice to support all of this in an integrated or interconnected way. So at this stage, I'd like to quickly introduce what we do at MDS as a quick advert to solving these challenges. We have a IT monetization practice called IT Monetized. Uh, it's based on an engine that integrates with IT platforms, networks, and edge solutions that not only mediate and rate those applications, but also to manage the full settlement, collection, credit management of service subscribers as well as partners. So for IT businesses, it manages the full revenue and settlement chain in an end-to-end -end profit assured uh, manner, building on behalf of all stakeholders. Our service-driven approach allows flexible implementation of any IT business model without businesses having to worry about the functional capabilities or limitations on a, on a technical basis. It's based on cloud infrastructure to scale on demand to service billions of IT events, especially as some IT applications have service surges uh, with large amounts of events coming in over a short period of time. And it's delivered as a service. It's not just us running the platform. It's us running your monetization process with assurance. We are, in fact, your billing team. So you, know, you don't need to actually build one. So to finalize, you know, as you prepare to take a bigger role as a lead enabler, ask yourself, you know, are you really prepared to monetize IT projects equally well as designing, designing them um, and building them? Yeah. For example, like a smart city refuge solution where the objective is for new revenues while saving the planet, would you be able to charge in real time for, for each bin that gets emptied? Have we actually addressed how partners will be onboarded and settled 
especially if they're part of a pay-to-deliver model. In our example, they get paid more if they use IoT data to drive less miles. Are you able to enhance revenues in, in time with upsell notifications based on IoT data? In our example, offer subscribers advanced options to empty bins earlier for their convenience. Now, the whole IoT world is about re-commercializing our world using data for better experiences, accessibility, and availability. Now, how will you ensure that the entire operation is sustainable, accurate, and profit assured? You know, for, from our point of view, MDS is here. We make it easy. Um, what you'll find is that a lot of the information from both Stephen, um, Stephen's survey report, as well as information which is about, uh, about our use cases and our customers and our capabilities, uh, you'll find that on our web, white papers on our website. The links are there on the um, on the screen. And I think we're going to go to our second poll question now. Right? Is that right, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you, Akil. Uh, the uh, it's um, it's. It's been a fascinating thing. So the next question is uh, for our audience, do you have strategic in these initiatives to provide IoT enterprises more than network connectivity and device management? And the responses can be already doing so, launching within the next one to two years, launching within the next two to five years, currently building the services, currently designing the strategy, and no plans. Um, so while we wait for the audience uh, to respond to that, what what fascinated me about that last video uh, that you showed, Akil, was the uh, fact that, you know, when it really brought home the fact that when we talk about smart cities as an IoT application, it's it's a simple definition, smart cities, but there's such a complexity of different opportunities, you know, from street lighting to garbage can collection to traffic management to security to snow clearing. I mean... All of those present opportunities, and each one of them is a different sort of monetization and billing opportunity. Absolutely, yeah. I think we've seen ourselves more smart city um, discussions than anything else. Um, and, and, it, and I think when you sort of when we sort of target these kind of markets, you have to break smart city down into the small applications. Some are obviously government-led. Um, when and the government is outsourcing to uh, you know, a private um, initiative, um, and some are actually sort of disruptive, enterprise-led, where they're going back up to councils and governments with with some ideas. But they all revolve around, I think, what you talked about in the initial part of the survey, is around the concept of either energy, um, refuse, uh, transport. Um, they all fall into those sort of those buckets that um, the survey initially pointed out. Okay, so let's see see where people are, are in terms of their um, strategic initiatives. Twenty five percent are already doing. Eighteen percent in the next one to two years. Twelve percent in the next two to five years. Six percent currently building services. Twelve percent designing, and twenty five percent no plans. How does that spread compared to what you're That's, seeing customers? Well, it's roughly in alignment with our survey. We had about 40% from our survey rights. We had, yeah. we had sort of some sort of plans. Um, yeah, so that's that's good. I think it sort of ties up with our survey. Um, interesting, actually, 25% are already doing so uh, compared to, and that's quite high, I thought, actually. I thought some people mm. are planning in the, in the next one or two years. I mean, there are businesses like sort of Telenor, Telenor Connections and Vodafone and AT&T that have had these sort of business units in place for a while now. So and they are quite substantial business units. You know, they, they so own sort of 65% of the market to date. So maybe that 25% is actually aligned okay. So the, it, I mean, I think the interesting thing that you you brought up and, and it's sort of, it would be interesting relative to this is, um, the sort of the new emerging business unit. I mean, I've, I've sort of actively said that this should have been the approach because if you go back to the old 
uh, wireline days in the the original telecoms business, you know, when they created cellular in the first 1G, 2G world, they created separate business units because the mindset had to change. I mean, you had to rediscover new or discover new business models. They haven't quite sort of moved as fast in this IoT world, and yet it is it is such a huge. I mean, when you look at what 5G is going to deliver, if you're not sort of creating new mindsets you know like for instance this shift between capex and opex as a as a mentality for the mindset or you know the creation of a new type of mvno or a, a new type of, sort of um, lead enabler it's if they're not doing that then they're going to get trapped um, i mean that's yeah. that's to my mind i think anyway well, absolutely. We've talked to a number of providers, or CSPs already, okay, and they do like the idea of adding IT modernization as part of their service catalog. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that's often by an existing sort of B2B unit or B2B X unit. But when it comes to it, you know, we talked to them again a few months later on how that's progressing their strategies. They've made no progress. You know, they said, well, it's, it's challenging. You know, we know how to sell connectivity. Maybe it knows the price of that, and we have our system set up. But trying to add this new part to the service catalog is, you know, is just a mare. And the, the best success is where they've started to actually move and actually move our discussions to the IT business unit, which now tends to be really a separate, more global unit. But first of all, they're sort of starting to, um, first of all, sort of use the different opcodes that they may have across the organization to provide a global NBIT network or global IT network, first of all, but then again, provide their own uh, commercial approach, have a very different culture, that they're no longer selling connectivity, but using connectivity as an enablement path to get to those IT projects. And even have, you know, some of our CSPs are even sort of bidding for those smart city projects, and in fact, that, that movie was based on the initiative we have with an operator trying to bid uh, for smart city projects uh, in Europe. Okay, So they wanted to lead it as a system integrator. They're also going to bring that sort of whole connectivity piece into it, but they were going to bring together the IT platform, do the development for that, suggest the devices as well, and run the entire show. They did have some local partners, but again, they were part of that mix. And in fact, that's actually what drove our entire solution from the beginning when we started to discuss this model and then sort of see that again and again with, in, in, in some of the other CSP. So I completely agree. It has to be a cultural mind, mind shift for, uh, for most uh, CSPs to do this properly. So can you share maybe which CSPs you're currently working with on rollouts of IoT projects and ecosystems? I can't announce the one that we did the Smart City project with, but I can say they are probably the largest MBIT network outside of China globally. Um, that's a hand. Um, we do have other t uh, customers. For example, we have uh, you know doing both machine to machine and IT. Uh, we have uh, BT, for example, Telefonica O2. Um, we've got people like Air. Air offer IoT Connect themselves. OT provides OT Drive, for example. So yeah, we have some customers. I think some of the use cases actually are online on our website. Uh, but a smart city one, yeah, I can't pronounce yes. So, yeah, I would love to. The the um, as you as you approach each of these, Akil, do you are you finding that there is a uh, a different mentality? By by region or by country in terms of um, how people how you know the CSPs are looking at. I mean, because that was one of the things that emerged from the survey. Yeah, I mean, our, our presence at the moment is very much in Europe, uh, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, and our campaign so far is focused on Europe. So I can certainly uh, talk about that, and you know. The, the conversation typically goes along the lines of, you know, we've seen this. We've got one or two projects that our uh, business unit have come across, and we like to approach it. We don't have the capabilities our existing BSS is designed to sell machine-to-machine -machine sims, but you know, it, it can't do any any more exotic bidding than that. Um, you know, what can we do 
just to get that project. So a lot of that is actually based on opportunities in our CSPs themselves, and we'll do that on a tactical basis. But when it comes to long-term strategic sort of discussions uh, on supporting their overall business aims, the conversation tends to go quiet for a few months while they go back and do their soul searching on, you know, is this something that is a one-off because we need to achieve our IoT revenue targets for this year, or is it something that we need to do a lot more strategically and actually build a business around? And that, you know, that that discussion takes a long time. It, take, it can take from six months to a year, and even then, it's it, it's a it's a slow burn. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a build, which is possibly why you know what you found in the survey is the market is still pretty nascent. And I think once a few CSPs, I mean, some of them are already doing so, right? Telenor, for example, is Vodafone, for example, is so is AT and T. And once some of these larger CSPs start to announce these so more chunky revenues on those IT projects, then I think we'll see a lot of other CSPs follow. Right. And and as you start to sort of talk with these different CSPs in different countries, I mean, you know, obviously um, you, you provide core billing functions, but what added value benefits are they looking to serve, serve up and, and how can you help them with that in terms of monetizing IoT? Well, one of the things we don't do or we try not to do is just sell um, our platform, right? Um, um, we, you know, we, you know do, when customers do come to us, um, they do want just a license for, for the platform. Uh, but when we start talking about, you know, what kind of monetization models are, are you ready for? Um, it seems quite transpires that, you know, they've got a few deals in the pipeline, but, you know, they don't actually have a broad scope of what they want. And so when we talk about, well, why don't you just let us manage the entire service for you? You just give us the business model per deal that you have. We we'll provide an SLA in terms of number of days. We'll turn that around and deploy that in a solution so you're ready for your deal. You don't have to worry about pricing or extensive cost in terms of trying to get to that deal in itself. We'll give you a fixed SLA. They quite like that because they no longer have to worry about the functional limitations of the box. All, all they know is the service level agreement with us. We'll implement it. We'll operate it for them. Um, and we, we have obviously we know our solution better than anybody else, but we also provide that assurance around them as well. So they like that. And it, very often, most of the license-based discussions where they start have, have, have been converted into a full as a service deal. So. And that's, and that's one of the CSP, one of the USBs we 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 bring. We actually have very strong managed services capability to do that. And the are you seeing a mindset shift in terms of how CSPs are looking at um, the, the the managed services aspect as opposed to sort of you know the the traditional capex and and you know own it yourself. Absolutely, I think um, I think you know, as we discussed, you know, um, you know, with cloud as it is um, coming in, with, with more operators accepting uh, or actually sort of believing that an OPEX-based model works from a from an infrastructure point of view in terms of operating it on cloud infrastructure to the actual license being built not on a perpetual basis but on a prescriber or per RGU basis instead, and then. A simple cost per per RGU for looking after the service, um, you know, the, the mass adds up a lot. And also, a lot of IT projects are pretty risky still, right? They're not very nascent. There are a lot of great ideas, but there's a lot of crazy ideas out there. So they don't really want to spend a huge bunch of money, invest a huge bunch of money in a capex form themselves to invest in a project that may sort of peter out um, in, in this very sort of disruptive state that the market is in right now. So going to pay as you grow model with us and also uh, us looking after the complexity of things which they sort of themselves are trying to figure out themselves as CSPs, you know, it's a win-win situation for, for everyone. And, and I'm, I'm assuming then that really, I mean, the, the cloud-based approach, which gives you sort of, you know, uh, versatility, agility, and scalability it also gives you the opportunity to service diverse customer needs across a broad 
uh, geographic spans as well, right? I mean, do you use this sort of a common cloud solution, or or is it adaptive to to regions and and um, and clients? Uh, no, yeah, we have, it has to be adaptive. I mean, you know, we our platform will be host, can be hosted on um, Azure as well as on Amazon and Google Cloud, for example. But generally, data regulation is is a key issue. Uh, and where the data resides in the platform. So, you know, the operator actually selects which public or private cloud environment they want in region uh, to support, and we can set up an instance in region on that public or cloud or private cloud infrastructure. So we'll obviously point to our preferences um, because there's obviously a cost element. The way, for example, Amazon charges for infrastructure is actually quite different to the way Azure charges it and the way the costs scale up depending on how capacity comes in and out of the platform. So we have our preferences to manage our underlying costs, but generally where the customer is and the availability of a strong, obviously this is, you know, revenues coming through, we have a strong, resilient solution in region plays probably the more important part of this equation. Right. Um, so, so another question that's come in is, um, what percentage of revenue should CSPs be aiming for from IoT over the next coming five to ten years, and will they ever get payback on the needed investment? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, it depends how they structure how, how they structured. I mean, the last deal we did uh, that that very own, the CSP that was involved in that one certainly got four times as much revenue. From that in, that approach than it did by just selling connectivity alone. Okay, um, the amount of revenue they get out of a, an IoT deal depends on how much enablement they provide. Most CSPs we've dealt with don't provide the entire solution. Yeah, they may provide the connectivity, some edge solutions, some services to deploy, and they may point um, to an application development team um, to do it on. But they don't provide the full with full support. In fact, actually, system integrators are probably better at that than many CSPs, or CSPs are not prepared yet to go to the levels where system integrators do a probably a better job. So they tend to pair up, and at the moment, CSPs are probably getting a smaller proportion. I would say something in, you know, in the region of about 30%, 40% of deal value, as opposed to where system integrators today, are, which are in the in the region of around 70, 80% of, of deal value. So I think CSPs have got a long way to go. To become more and more like sort of system integrators or IT or business process outsourcers, but I think they're learning, and I think again it's a nascent market. There's opportunity for them. The key thing is that they actually own the network. It's, it's a vital part of some contract deals. They have um, the experience of running an operation, which um, you know most IT businesses don't have. You know, if they can run a network with phones and minutes, etc. Yeah, they, they, they can leverage that, that to run an IT service. Uh, but they still have to still learn that whole design and build phase. And I think a lot of CSPs are actually relying on other parties to support them for that and therefore losing part of the revenue. And, and I think building on that, Akil, the I mean, MBIOT and LTEM really have only sort of in the last 18, 18 months started to sort of, you know, make their presence felt. I mean, it took you know, a great job in terms of, you know, for the industry going from, you know, not having anything to having chipsets and deploying the network. But really, it's only in the last 18 months that really the, the availability of those chipsets, the availability of the network has really sort of generated new opportunities. And people are starting to see, like, for instance, the one that you talked about, where it's this combination of 3G, 4G backhaul with MBIOT to create a new type proposition to, to replace kerosene. Um, that that type of creative thinking is only just beginning to emerge. And, and from my perspective, as you start to look at the 5G deployments that you know, with massive machine type communications and ultra reliable uh, requirements for robotics, and then you start to think about connected uh, vehicles and you start to think about private networks and network slicing, there is a whole raft of new opportunities that are going to be a built around those, which 
requires a totally different mindset and a totally different um, uh, you know, approach to ecosystem management, delivery of services, management of the customers, evolution of the business. Oh, completely. And this is something I love, love the most, right? I think many operators, that wholesale, that B2B, B2B to X is going to explode once they get 5G, but not 5G, but more of that sort of personalized network service enablement that some of the SDN and NFP things start to promise. And I know that's still sort of two, three, four away, four years away from being realized. But once you get to a point where part of the service is providing a personalized or a private, or as they call it, a network slice or what I'm also seeing in Germany and the US, they, they're sort of now launching sort of completely private 5G networks. You know, the part of the spectrum is sort of organized for maybe sort of BMW, for example, to have their own private 5G network across all the factory sites, for example. That, that, that just feeds this entire thing where CSPs can now provide an exceptionally personalized IoT service. Um, more than just some of the best effort stuff that they do today on 4G. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, I've put up the uh, survey um, for our readers, uh, please, if, or our listeners, um, please take the uh, time to fill it in because it gives us the opportunity to provide you with uh, more interesting, better shaped and, and focused webinars. And uh, we, we look forward to the feedback. Akil, um, thank you very much. I mean, fascinating conversation, tremendous um, uh, you know, insight in terms of uh, you know, what you've learned and, and how do you address the market. Uh, and uh, thank you for your, your time. And to the audience, thank you very much for staying with us. I uh, hope you found it interesting and on point. And uh, we look forward to uh, having, uh, having another session with you um, on similar subjects in the future. That's great. Thank you, Stephen.